I'll just present my uh, lecture. Is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> I meant. Uh... <laughs> um, yes, my presentation is entitled uh, Humana Vita in Context the two commissions. Uh, first of all, it is an honor and joy to speak to you, to be with you here today. And uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you on the most fundamental matters concerning human existence. My goal is to offer a glimpse into Cardinal Wojtyła's contribution to the encyclical Humana Vitae. My lecture consists of three main parts. First, I will introduce the Papal Commission with its two opposing positions concerning the transmission of life, of human life. Then, I will introduce the so-called Krakow Commission and in its light present Wojtyła's personalistic approach to conjugal life. Finally, I will briefly show that Humana Vitae reflects this approach. So, on to the first part. Established by Pope John XXIII and re-established by uh, Pope Paul VI, the Pontifical or Papal Commission for the Study of Population, Family and Births met in five sessions between October 1963 and June 1966. The purpose of the Commission was to study contemporary problems concerning population, family and procreation to suggest conclusions or possibly even moral norms based on this study, and in this way to advise the Pope. In its final stage, in early 1966, the commission, was, uh, the commission consisted of 16 members and 58 experts, both lay and religious. Two opposing positions within the commission crystallized over time, the orthodox minority and the progressive majority each side producing their own documents. The minority produced the minority report. The majority fathered three documents overall, the rebuttal to the minority report, the um, majority report, and its introduction known as the pastoral introduction or the pastoral approaches. In its final act on June 28, 1966, the Secretary of the Papal Commission presented to the Pope the majority report with the pastoral introduction as the official legacy of the Commission. The, the President of the, of the Commission was not present. The President was uh, Cardinal Ottaviani. was not present at that, at that time at the presentation of the, of the majority report to the Pope. Concerning the minority and its argument, in a rather chaotic argument, the minority of the Papal Commission argued against contraception using two sources. One, the authority of the teaching of recent popes, that is Leo the Twelfth, Pius the Eleventh, and Pius the Twelfth, and two, the precepts of natural law. The minority saw contraception as a deliberate and voluntary frustration on, of man's natural generative power, the power ordained for the procreation of human life. Hence, contraception was a violation of the fifth commandment, you shall not kill, the commandment that also belongs to natural law. Since it is a violation of the natural generative power, contraception struck at the heart of marriage which was considered an institution of the order of nature established for procreation. The minority argued that by belonging to natural law, the prohibition of contraception is accessible to unprejudiced reason, is unchangeable and universal. The minority rejected the claims of its critics that human nature and the particular norms of morality are adaptable and perfectible historically. Overall, the minority accused the majority of harboring a false concept of natural law, one built on a misguided conception of human nature as a complex of physical and psychical powers in the world granted to the dominion of man. The majority, on the other hand, argued for lifting the ban on contraception under certain conditions, 
in light of the deepened appreciation of the human person and conjugal love. It stressed the development of doctrine and referred to the texts of sacred scripture and Vatican II. According to the ma majority, it is the minority that misunderstood human nature and thus misapplied the concept of natural law to moral norms. The majority denies that the gifts of nature are a direct expression of God's will. Instead, man is endowed with the task to receive nature and perfect its potentiality. The majority is clear. The dignity of the human person consists in sharing in God's dominion over the earth by exercising rationality, that is, by using physical nature to grow in man's own perfection in conformity with the dictates of right reason. The, uh, the document doesn't actually explain what it really means. We see that in this tempting view, human personhood is closely linked with technology. Indeed, the majority identifies man's intervention in nature by technological means as God's primary will and intention with respect to man. Moreover, the majority report understands the entire history of relations between God and man in terms of technological progress. The application of this understanding to the task of regulating conceptions is obvious. The more man intervenes in the natural generative processes by using his technological skill to avoid or to affect procreation, the more he conforms himself to his rational nature and to the will of God. The majority concludes that contraceptive intervention in conjugal acts is morally permissible as long as it is ordained to essential <coughs> values of marriage. Now concerning the second part of my lecture, let me introduce the Krakow Commission. On February 16, 1966, Pope Paul VI appointed Karol Wojtyła, the Archbishop of Kraków, to the Papal Commission. Unfortunately, the communist government of Poland prevented Wojtyła from attending the meetings of the commission. However, not knowing their content and suggested solutions, Wojtyła prepared his own memorandum and sent it to Paul VI in July 1966, so right after the Papal Commission was dissolved. In this memorandum, Wojtyła presented the moral principles governing sexual relations of the spouses from the personalistic perspective and provided an overview of the pastoral care concerning the methods of regulating conceptions in Poland. After the American, British, German, and French press published in 1967 the minority and majority reports of the Papal Commission, which were supposed to be <coughs> secret, Wojtyła initiated a collaboration with a group of five Polish moral theologians from Kraków, and I will spare you the names. <laughs> They're very Polish names. <laughs> Hence, the Kraków Commission came into existence. It produced three major documents. Wojtyła sent the first document to Paul VI in February 1968, so before the, uh, uh, the encyclical was issued, in which he defended the traditional moral teaching of the Church on conjugal life. <coughs> the second document of the Krakow Commission was a theological and pastoral commentary on the encyclical Humana Vitae published with a Polish translation of that encyclical in 1969. The third and the final document concerned the pastoral and indirectly also doctrinal consequences of the encyclical Humana Vitae. After having personally edited the text of the memorandum, Wojtyła sent it to Paul VI in March 1971. The approach of Wojtyła and the Krakow Commission differs from both positions of the Papal Commission. The Krakow Commission confirms the traditional teaching of the Church, mandating responsible parenthood and prohibiting contraception by employing an authentically personalistic argument. 
This argument integrates natural law within a theological context. Let me outline this argument and briefly discuss its content. Wojtyła's personalistic argument consists of three main elements, value, norm, and price. First, he speaks of value, the value of the human person, the value of conjugal life and love. Then he discusses the norms that govern the proper relations between persons. There are norms that correspond to that value. And finally, he portrays the price or effort required to keep these norms. Wojtyła is fully aware that the contemporary man understands marriage and conjugal morality in the category of values more than of ends. The modern man sees marriage and its importance in light of values such as life, love, and the human person than the ends that the marriage is ordained to achieve. Accordingly, the Krakow Commission begins by its substantiation of the prohibition of contraception by the church with reflections on the human person and his dignity. The human person is a, as a unique, unrepeatable and irreplaceable value becomes the basis for establishing moral principles. In fact, the accent on the person in no way undermines the teaching on natural law. The Krakow Commission defines natural law as the objective moral order inscribed in the rational nature of man. This very definition rejects the opinion that the traditional conception of natural law disregards the rational and personal elements by emphasizing ontological or even biological elements. In order to show that natural law fully corresponds to man as a person, Wojtyła suggests reviewing the traditional definitions of the person, law, and natural law to discover that they all concern human rational nature. Moreover, natural law confirms and reveals the dignity of the human person. Let me explain this fact first in the cosmological and theological context. The acceptance, so first the cosmological context, the acceptance of natural law presupposes on the part of man the fundamental attitude of reception which, by the way, corresponds to the generosity of being, for nothing is received unless it is first given. The human person discovers an objective order of being to which natural law conforms. Hence, natural law properly positions the human person in the cosmos, in the entire given hierarchy of values. In this integral view, man's actions bear a responsibility towards the beings of the world, whose values are based on the beings themselves and their perfection within the world. Consequently, natural law indicates the capacity and the need to understand the nature of things, their values, their interrelations, and to act accordingly. In other words, Wojtyła and the Krakow Commission situate the ontological definition of the person, uh, which is the substantial subject of conscious and free acts, within a contemplative relation to the world, a relation that manifests the transcendence of the human person the most. However, now this, is the, this, is con this concerns the theological context. However, the value of the person is ultimately due to his fundamental relation to God. Wojtyła recognizes not only that man finds his origin and fulfillment in God, but also that the human person is a manifestation, a revelation of God in and his love in the visible world. The acceptance of natural law is an acknowledgement of the human person to be a creature of God, made to his image. The rejection of natural law means a rejection of human creatureliness, thus a rejection of man's ontological and moral dependence on God, and ultimately his supernatural vocation, since gratia supponit naturam. Since natural law is a participation of eternal law in a rational creature, through natural law, 
the human person is capable of participating in the thought of God, the creator and lawgiver. And through human action, the person shares in God's providence over the world. Man's dominion over himself and the world is not absolute but ministerial, one of service or, or stewardship. Let us recall that the majority of the Papal Commission understood the dignity of the human person in light of using his nature effectively for the sake of man's greater good. Two major problems beset this understanding. First, because nature, this natural law, is a constitutive component of human person, the use of human nature as a mere means to an end violates the integrity of the human person. In light of man's hilomorphic unity and the fundamentally contemplative character of human existence, allowing contraceptive interventions to deliberately frustrate the natural generative process for the sake of man's well-being is self-contradictory. Hence, Wojtyla does not advocate mastering nature by using it, as if nature was some external thing devoid of meaning and finality. But mastering of nature uh, happens by adapting, and it's a quote from Love and Responsibility, adapting to its immanent dynamic. Second, the view of the majority undermines human rationality. The Krakow Commission indicates that although the human person belongs to the world, he distinguishes himself from other earthly beings by the capacity for a responsible or we can say rational, moral life. Wojtyla explains that the essence of human rationality does not consist in calculating the best ways of attaining a chosen good or a consequence. Rather, the essence of rationality lies in the ability of reason to know the objective truth about good, to know bonum honestum, to determine norms in accordance with this truth and to live by them in order to become a good person, thereby fulfill himself. <coughs> Once the honorable good ceases to be the end of human striving, reason loses its governing role and is relegated to a subservient utilitarian function. This is precisely what happens in the pro-contraceptive and pro-technological mentality of the majority of the Papal Commission. This mentality presupposes either the Humean slash Benthamian model, in which the honorable good is replaced by a useful good or pleasure, or the Kantian model, in which the honorable good is replaced by the independence of reason from passions. In either case, human reason loses its contemplative attitude and consequently its governing function. But what is this honorable good? What is this bonum honestum, which is so constitutive for human personhood and his fulfillment? Ultimately, of course, it is God. God and the communion with him. The God who is to be desired to be loved for his own sake. However, in some sense, we can say that the honorable good is also the human person, who, as Gaudium et Spes tells us, is the only creature on earth, willed by God for its own sake. Wojtyla formulates the personalistic norm to express the supra-utilitarian value of the person, in virtue of what he is and what he is called to do, or called to, the human person should never be used as a mere means to an end, but should be always loved. Love is the only proper response to the value that the person is, perfecting both its subject and its object by fully realizing the being of each. For Wojtyla, the evangelical commandment to love is the fundamental expression of the personalistic norm. It is simply personalistic norm formulated as a positive in a positive way, whereas the personalistic norm is a negative uh, prohibition of using uh, the human person. And for Wojtyla, the norms proposed by Humana Vitae are determinations of the commandment to love. Now let me speak a little about the problem of separating love from procreation. 
We have established that the value of the person demands love as the most appropriate relation toward that person. According to Wojtyla, to love a person primarily means to affirm that person as such. This affirmation, however, includes the human body with all its natural and supernatural relations in which this person remains. This love has a specific character within conjugal and familial life. The minority completely disregarded the issue of conjugal love, whereas the majority found it extrinsic to parenthood and procreation. The majority argued that the statements of the recent popes and Vatican II paved the way for conferring a primary importance to conjugal love in marriage over the procreative finality of the sexual act. These statements, in the majority's opinion, accepted a separation between the sexual act and its reproductive effect by allowing sexual intercourse during a woman's periods of infertility. This position of the majority reflected the conciliar discussion concerning the traditional teaching on the ends of marriage. This discussion questions, questioned the suitability of the subordination of the secondary end of marriage which is mutuum adutorium, often, often improperly translated as conjugal love, to the primary end, procreatio, in light of the personalistic understanding of marriage as a covenant of persons determined by love. The majority argued that contraceptive interventions can be integrated within an ordered relationship to responsible, generous, and prudent fruitfulness. In other words, a couple's openness to life in the dimension of their whole life would determine the morality of each and every particular conjugal act. So if a couple has two or three children, then it proves sufficiently that they are open to life so they can use contraception. Wojtyla and the Krakow Commission do not understand the primacy of conjugal love in separation from procreation. Quite the contrary. Wojtyla presupposes an organic bond between conjugal love and parenthood. He quotes Article 50 of the uh, Constitution Gaudium et Spes, of the Second Vatican Council, which declares that, quote, marriage and conjugal love are by their nature ordained toward the begetting and educating of children. Now let me stress the point. The text speaks about marriage and conjugal love having natural ordination to procreation, so not, not simply the conjugal act. The <coughs> conjugal act is, is, is a sign of love, and this is what Dr. Walker mentioned when he said that the sexual act is the nuptial symbol of being in love. Um, yes. This intrinsic connection between love and fruitfulness finds its origin in the mystery of the triune God and is manifested in the mystery of creation. Wojtyla stresses that the personalistic dimension does not eliminate the teleological one. No conflict exists between the evangelical commandment to love and natural law. For the human person does not cease to inhere in the order of nature and to be subject to natural law. In authentic renewal, the order of the traditional ends is neither neutralized nor reversed, but retained, thus affirming the values protected by revelation and the living tradition of Christian morality. Rather, this renewal brings a shift of normative accents onto the person and love. Hence, in his 1966 memorandum that uh, sent to the Pope, Wojtyla writes, and I quote, the point is not to position love as the end of marriage superior to procreation, but to subordinate marriage with all its ends to the chief norm, which is the norm of loving. Finally, the third element of Wojtyla's authentically personalistic thought is the effort that is required in loving the person, loving the other person. Wojtyla observes that it is Jesus Christ who teaches that authentic good requires sacrifice. In Wojtyla's own words, and I quote, 
the cross of Christ became the price for human redemption. On the way to true values, every man must assume something of this cross as a price that he himself will pay for true values." End quote. Cultivating human love in marriage in the context of parenthood is a difficult, arduous good that requires the practice of the virtue of chastity as an expression of love, an expression of a total self-giving. While the Papal Commission understood abstinence as an unnecessary hardship that in the least hinders spousal union, Wojtyla and the Krakow Commission see that love also expresses itself in periodic abstinence. It is so, because although love can relinquish conjugal acts, it can never relinquish the authentic gift of the person. Anyone who presents the teaching of the Church on sexual morality and disregards or undermines the necessity of virtuous self-denial in marital and pre- or and extramarital relations between human persons fails to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness. Now, the last part of my presentation. Let me begin the final part of this, uh, this lecture with a remark on Wojtyla's overall satisfaction with the encyclical, the encyclical Humana Vitae. Despite certain suggestions that Pope John Paul II was somewhat dissatisfied with the encyclical, my research does not corroborate such claims. Moreover, there are signs that Pope Paul VI was satisfied with his work too. In December 1972, Wojtyla remarked, and I'll quote, several times I talked with the Pope before and even more times after the encyclical was issued. Several times after the encyclical was published, I heard the following, several, I'm sorry, several years after the encyclical was published, I heard the following sentence. If I was writing it now, after this entire wave, I could not write anything more." End quote. Of course, this does not prevent us from studying the encyclical and uh, developing its insights. We said that Wojtyla's argument based on authentic personalism follows three stages. First, he presents the human person as a unique and unrepeatable value. Then he indicates the moral norms that promote this value. And finally, he describes the price, as it were, that the human person must pay to live in this world in accord with his dignity. Humana Vita adopts this threefold structure. Due to time constraints, let me, let me offer just limited examples to prove it. Even though it uses the word person sparingly, Authentic personalism shines through everything that the encyclical Humana Vita says about man and human love. The personalistic approach is evident from the fact that St. Paul VI understands marriage as the communion of persons that perfects its subjects. This is from Article 8. Also, the dignity of the spouses is further recognized in the fact that they share with God in the generation and rearing of new lives through conjugal love, which takes its origin from God who is love. This is from Humana Vita 8. In Article 23, the encyclical specifies human dignity as the principle for solving particular social and economic issues. Paul VI quotes the encyclical Mater et Magistra of uh, Pope St. John XXIII to make his point. He says, no statement of the problem and no solution to it is acceptable, which does violence to man's essential dignity. Guided by the commandment to love, Humana Vita proposes two main norms of conduct. The positive norm, that mandate, mandates conscious or responsible parenthood, and the negative norm that prohibits contraception, abortion, and other ways of disrupting the process of transmitting life. 
It substantiates the norms by observing the inseparable connection between two aspects of conjugal love, the unitive and the procreative. In Article 12, Paul VI refers to the inseparable connection between the unitive signification and the procreative signification, which are both inherent to the marriage act. According to Wojtyla, by using the word signification, significatio, the author of the encyclical places the whole problem not only within the nature of the conjugal act, but also within human consciousness, thus within the understanding of the performed act. Hence, the conjugal act is understood within the personal dimension. We also see an application of the personalistic norm in Article 17 of the encyclical, which describes the use of a person by another as a consequence of contraception. The Pope writes, a man who grows accustomed to the use of contraceptive methods may forget the reverence due to a woman and reduce her to being a mere instrument for the satisfaction of his own desires. Finally, concerning the price, the price which conjugal love and the values linked to it require is a particular effort, or as Paul VI puts it, a firm purpose and many labors that he says in Article 20. In fact, according to Wojtyla, the last part of the encyclical is a call to undertake such labors. The Pope directs his, this call not only to spouses, but also to entire societies, public authorities, scientists, medical professionals, priests and bishops. Only by patient imitation of Christ in his self-denial can the love of Christian spouses flourish, becoming more human, more spiritual, and more holy. Hence, we read in the encyclical in Article 13 that practicing the virtue of conjugal chastity includes periodic abstinence, including periodic abstinence, develops spouses' personhood and equips their love with spiritual values. In Article 25, the Pope reminds his readers that the Church offers men grace, for through grace, man is made a new creature, responding in charity and true freedom to the design of his creator and savior, experiencing the sweetness of the yoke of Christ. And now concluding. The encyclical simply reminds us about the greatness of the true values in our life and about our responsibility for cultivating them. In other words, Humana Vitae proposes the moral norms to safeguard the transcendence of the human person. Thank you. <laughs>